episode four of Sparks Entertainment and Art, the show on YouTube about Sparks and their fans and the intense relationship a lot of fans have with the band. And we're also going to talk about some other things as the show proceeds, as I've mentioned, but we have a great guest with us today. And before I get to you, John, just be patient because I got a major announcement here. Ready? You ready? Okay. Okay. Here's the announcement. We now have a email uh, set up for the show. It's called Sparks Entertainment and Art, one word, Sparks Entertainment and Art at gmail.com. So if you feel like uh, sending me a personal comment, or if you feel that you have a story to tell and you think it would be interesting and you really want to get it out and you think people will like to hear it, drop me a line and we'll see what we can do. Uh, that's the major announcement. Was that pretty big, John? Sounds good to me. Sounds good? Okay. Yeah. Well, let, then we'll move on from that. Um, but let's go ahead and introduce our guest. Our guest today is John Ashdown. We are going international, folks, because Sparks are the opposite of Grand Funk Railroad. They are not, they're from America, but they're not really an American band. They're about as international as you can get. So we are going international today, and we're talking with John Ashdown. And John, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Well, all right. And we are really happy to have you, or I, I have to talk in the singular, I am really happy to have you, but uh, I'm wondering if you can spend a few minutes just introducing yourself, telling a little bit about you and who you are and what you do. And also, how did you get into Sparks in the first place and when? Over to you. Okay. Well, um, let's see. I'm I'm 64 now. Um, I'm retired. Um I used to be, I used to work in the law courts in London um, and did that for about 38 years, um, on and off running courthouses and um, uh, training judges in various pieces of software towards the end and also project management in that I uh, created a a brand new courtroom, family courtroom in, in West London, the first one for 50 years apparently. Um, so there's that side of it, it to me. Um, let's see what else. Um, since retirement, I'm mainly a, a gardener, as you can see from the background. Um, what else do I do? Um, in terms of, of sparks, let's let's talk about that. Um, the usual thing for most British um, fans is that they either heard this town on the radio back in 1974 or they saw sparks on top of the box. In my case, it was both because that week when I heard sparks on Radio One um, at lunchtime during my school school uh, days, I think I was 15, um, I was like really knocked out by the sound. Um, this was something a little bit different. And then that Thursday, they were on top of the pops and you get to see the band themselves. And again, just knocked out by, um, I think it, it was their first appearance, which probably would have had Martin Gordon on. Um, I think he was on that very first appearance before they got rid of him, so to speak. Um, what else is there? And and that was it, that was it. And mainly, I think, uh, because I had a friend who bought the single. I borrowed it off him. I didn't have the money to buy singles back in those days, even at 15, and I didn't have the cash. So, you know, I was playing it constantly and taping it. Um, in fact, I did that with Kimono. I didn't buy Kimono My House. He lent me Kimono My House, and I taped it. So, um, yes, back in the day, uh, taping uh, on cassettes, and everybody had C90s in those days, and you would, you know, tape somebody's album um and i remember putting the b-sides of both this town and i managed to buy amateur hour and i put on lost and found on there alongside barbecue which is one of my favorite songs have i gone too far no, stop it? not at all I, you know it's a little hard for me to relate because i'm so much younger than you i'm 63 Right. So, you know, all of this is like a different generation to me, you know, but, you know, but uh, as I've said before, my story is similar, but it's really interesting hearing it from your perspective because you were hearing them in the UK and it was all fresh. Whereas, you know, we know the background of how they got there. 
But that's what I think gives you some really interesting perspective here, which, you know, we don't get from Americans like me who tended to hear it, you know, on TV. I think most of us saw it on TV and said, oh, that's good. We'll explore it. But you heard it firsthand. Yeah, I mean, I was lucky. In that, um, I had a couple of friends who are still um, my old school friends, still still we chat and every now and again um, we have conversations sometimes through Zoom, for instance. Um, and I was lucky that they too were became very big Sparks fans. And it was one of those guys who, whose album I, I borrowed at the time. So the first actual Sparks record I bought was Amateur Hour. I then bought the two singles after that. And then my first album was Propaganda, which is my my main love. I mean, that's my number one Sparks album, I think. And, and that's probably because... Um, in most cases, you attach a time period to the albums that you buy. Yeah. And if you're going through you know, great periods in your life and you've got an album that sticks in your mind, you always associate that with that particular time. And I think January 75, I had my, my birthday gift with some money and off I went to buy propaganda. And I later bought Kimono um, probably a couple of months later on. But um, propaganda was always my my first love, and still is, I think. Oh, I mean, it's 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 propaganda. There's not really much I can add to that. I mean, I came into them with uh, Indiscreet. That it was after Indiscreet was the first album that I bought new, you know. And I'm interested in your thoughts about that because when I heard it, it was like, yeah, I had heard the first four albums. And I saw the I was just a kid like you, and I heard the first four albums. And I heard the progression, you know, from the first two to the third and fourth. And then all of a sudden you're hit with indiscreet and it's, oh, this is different. And it kind of locked me in as a Sparks fan. But what did you think when you heard indiscreet? Um, I really liked indiscreet. It was a little bit of um, a challenge because of the, the, the orchestral sound, the brass that was being used in it. Um, but the songs were so engaging. There was so much in there. Um, particularly because Ron is such a brilliant lyricist. I mean, he's really underrated as a great lyricist. I mean, there are really, really, really good lyricists around. And I, I know I hear about Bob Dylan and all that. But over here, you get great lyricists like uh, Elvis Costello, fantastic um, lyricist. Um, even Martin Fry of ABC, his lyrics are, are really, really good. Uh, and I think Ron Mel is up there with one of you know the best lyrics. So and some of the yeah, some of the songs so in the industry, it, it ain't 1918. Fantastic. I've never heard of a Stanley Steamer before. You know, absolutely superb. Um, again, that's, I think, yeah, that's my my favourite song on that album actually. Have you ever heard of a, a Chevy Power Drive before? Um, well, my wife is from the States, so she gives me all the all the feel about American, you know, sayings and things like that. So if there's something she brings up, like you know, you might be a car and this sort of thing, um, I, I'll literally explain it to me, you know, and I have to explain the English things here for her. You know. Well, I'd never heard of a Chevy Power Drive before. I had to look it up. <laughs> Okay, that's cool. That's cool. Uh, but we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, I guess. Uh, but so here it is a lot later than 1975. And my impression is that like me, um, you stayed with them the whole time. Or is that incorrect? Was there a period where you kind of turned to other things and then came back to them? Or was it just sparks were in your blood? Um, I stuck with them. Um, but there are other bands that I, I really like. My my other favourite band is a band called Wire, mm -hmm. who are an English punk, punk band, but they've been everything. They've been a big combo. They've been um, almost house at, at one time, you know, acid house almost. So, But Sparks were always there in the background, and I always bought the LPs, even if you couldn't get hold of them. I mean, the one LP that was never released here was Pulling Rabbits. And I managed to, because I was um, working near Oxford Street in one of the courts there, I was able to get to the Virgin Megastore, no longer there. And I rummaged around trying to find that particular album. And by pure fluke, I found it in the import section because it was a French release on that underdog records. And there it was, because uh, it wasn't in the Spark section. And I even asked the guy, I mean, have you got Pulling Rabbits? And he went, never heard of that, mate. And um, there it was. It was just on its own, one copy. Um, 
And even my friend, the guy I told you who lent me the very first album, he never got it. He never got that album. Uh, I had to lend him my album <laughs> so that he could hear it, you know. And you're a really big fan of Pulling Rabbits, right? Yeah, I love that. That's another um, what I would term all killer, no filler. Like propaganda, every track on there, you would not skip. If you had the CD version, you would not be moving on, you know, or lifting the needle and moving it across if you're a vinyl fan. Um, but, yeah, that, that was, that was that's a, a, a really underrated album. And it's not well known here purely because it never got released. And, of course, a lot of UK fans didn't pick up on some of the 80s albums, which I hear, which is it's quite amazing. When you meet meet them before you go to a gig or something, um, you know, you meet them in the pub before the, the Sparks concert, um, and, and they say, oh, no, I, I didn't know about that particular album or this album or whatever, and it's quite amazing. But, yeah, I stuck with it. But I, I want to get back to Pulling Rabbits because, as you know, that's not – most people don't consider it a particularly good album or it's okay. It has a few tracks. My personal take is that, unlike other albums, it has some songs I really like – and some songs I can't stand. It's not like it's a, a certain level of good or a certain level of mediocrity. It's just one or the other. And I think that view of pulling rabbits is a little bit unique. And what is it about that album in particular? And I, I don't want to obsess on this, but I find that so fascinating. Um, again, it goes back to, as I said, the, the, the year itself was 84. And that was a, a really stunning year for me things changed radically in my private life okay uh, and for the good positive and that album came at that sort of that sort of time um when uh you you had you had a lot of music around i think devo were out at the same time um and, and they had a good lp but that lp had everything on there that i that i really liked that sparks did um, and there were some great songs, you know, pretending to be drunk. I mean, what? who would put out a song like that? You know, it's just brilliant. And the 12 each version is, uh, of many of the songs off of there are, are terrific as well. That's, that's so cool. Uh, that's a good song. Uh, uh, there was a couple others um, for the, the title track. Yeah, yeah, that, um, With All My My Sisters, which is an unusual song. Sisters are so underrated. Yeah, I love it. But, you know, it's another Ron Mel classic, isn't it? You know, talking about a guy going out with, with two women, but they just have out to be sisters. And they, from the song, it appears they know about it. It's, it's perfectly OK. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. Thoughts on that. Yes. What do you think? Yeah. Uh, um, it's one of those slowish sort of songs that... that that sort of trots along in a way. And I, and I like that when they don't have to do heavy sort of rocky type um, music and they don't have to make it danceable. They can have something that's, you know, got melody to it that says something about the way in which they want to interpret a particular song and put it out there. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 but they well, come up with all it's, sorts it's, of... It's a happy stuff. album. There's no song on there that's like, Oh, that's maudlin, or you know, oh, that has working on so many levels and it's telling such a horrible and sad story. It's a happy album. Yeah, I think that they're still doing that now. We've we've um with some of the simple songs on Latte, like um Escalator, that is superb. And I I've heard people moan about it saying, nah, it's a bit craftworky or um it's not their style or it's it's too nihilistic. It's not, it's brilliant, it's absolutely a brilliant I song. Think. I agree. It was one of the last songs on the album that I came to appreciate. And since I've I've given a lot of thought to that album, which I'm going to talk about at some point on the show. Yeah. And now I think it's one of the most important and great songs on the album. And it's so simple. Yeah. I mean, one one of the things I perhaps I should have mentioned at the beginning about myself is that um I'm I'm like um one of five siblings and they're all miles older than me. I I was I was late in life for my mum, and um, uh, I was like a hole in the cold dome, I think. Um, and I, she, she had me 
Uh, I should have been, a, uh, I was, should have been a March born child, but I think she got caught in the January sales. So mm -hmm. uh, it, my brothers were a great influence on me music wise. And so when Sparks came along, that was, that was my own. Band. That was your own. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I had Beatles and I had the Stones and I had all sorts of people beforehand. I mean, I used to stay up at night and watch Old Grey Whistle Test. I don't know if you've heard of that, that particular yeah. show. Um, and, and kids at school wouldn't, wouldn't talk about Old Grey Whistle Test. They talk about Top of the Pops. They talk about you know, Sweet and Slade and all sorts of people like that over here. Mm -hmm. um, and I was getting Bowie and I got Roxy Music. But when Sparks came along, that was, that was my band. Why? What was it that in the music that made you just feel those strong that strong passion for the band? Again, there's there's the lyrics definitely, um, but uh, Ron's music is so there's there's such strength behind it, and the way in which he the production of the of the songs, or the way he, I mean, he must have had a hand in in quite a Quite a bit of it. I know it's a, a muff Winwood production and, and he does it in his particular style. But you could tell that there was that Ron was putting so much effort into the way the song sounds. Um and that came out in, in those first two albums for sure. Indiscreet is still a good album. I wouldn't say it's a an all killer, no filler, but it's but it's the the usual three island albums of what every fan talks about, of yes. my age at least. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, you mentioned the production and the relationship of Sparks and their producers, especially in the early years, especially obviously before they started producing it themselves. And you have a background in production. You do you do some music production. And I'm wondering if, if you want to talk about that, that would be great. But I'm wondering from that perspective, what you hear when you hear these different producers. Uh, and how they influence the music, given what you just said about Ron, which I'm yeah, um, the the product, the the amount of producers they've had is almost the same as how many record labels they've been on. Um, I would say, from a production point of view, I mean, I I work out of my own bedroom. I don't have a studio. Um, I am a producer of records based on using samples, a little bit of keyboard, sometimes my voice. Um, but the production is the bit that I've really improved. When I first got going, um, it was sort of electro pop, a bit, not 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 a Giorgio Marauder type thing, but it was very much in that vein. Uh, and I started it as a bit of a joke. That's why I've got the band name of Christ on a Bike, which is, you can just see, that's me with a wife and we're Christ on a Bike. Um, so she, she, she actually had a lot of songs, and that's how we got going. Um, and I would play around with her songs because they weren't particularly long. Once I got into the groove of making the first album, which was all done just as a sort of jokey aside, I, I made up names for the people who were on there, saying there was four people in the band, which there wasn't. Um, if you know Daniel Miller of Mute, he did the same thing with a band called Silicon Teens. Um, Back That's in great. 1978, yeah, he made um, an album of covers, electronic covers, basically, because you know he he, he did that with a number of um, famous songs from that time, and he just made up for uh, for kids' names and put them on there. But it was really all him. Um, and that's what I did. I, I did, you know, Christ on the Bike, I made up the lead singer as Chris Sakes. In other words, Christ Sakes, you know. Um, my wife was um holy ghast a holy ghast as it as about holy ghost right so it was it was a jokey thing but as soon as i'd done that first album the fact that other people heard it and said oh that's that's not bad your production's a bit near and i suddenly started getting into it in a big way and had to do another album and then another album and i couldn't stop and it was that that production and for me sparks are like that in the you can tell they put a lot of effort, particularly now, into the way they record their their, their music, particularly using uh, Russell's voice. Um, that's used almost as an instrument. It's it's superb. It, yeah, I mean, it's 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 not accurate to say he doesn't get the credit he deserves, but he still. I still feel that he's such an integral part. You know, sometimes people say Ron, Ron, Ron. 
and and Russell and I just always have trouble with that. I mean, he's so essential to their sound, isn't he? Yeah, definitely. Um, his voice is is unique. Um, there's only one other vocalist I can, I would say that's like him, and unfortunately, he's no longer with us. He's Billy McKenzie of the Associates. Yeah. Um, he has a similar voice, and he's done spark songs. I think he covered "Never Turn Your Back." Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's such a, a great great voice and it and it hasn't changed that much has it i mean he's how old is he now 73 74 um, i think um, and all the yeah. songs when they do them live are still in the same key yeah they were originally just mind-boggling yeah um from a from a production point of view you can tell that the way that ron uses russell's voice to enhance the sound i mean you you can hear that basically on a lot of the the recent records in terms of say um little Beethoven. I mean it's not one of my favorite albums, but the voice on there and the way it's used is, is superb. You know, it bounces almost around on the rec on the record yet or on the song. Um that is really good. That I mean to be able to produce it with that such finesse is superb. Yeah, which I couldn't get anywhere near that myself. Give us a couple of examples from your production perspective or your personal perspective of where you feel Russell's voice is just used as, as an instrument and just really hits you in a way that that is very remarkable to you personally? Um, well, I think you have to go back to, to songs like Bon Voyage. Um, I was really pleased that they had that um, in the set um, recently when I saw them at the Albert Hall here in London. Um, and that that really does come out. He, he, he goes right the way across almost the the, the scale. He's moving his voice across. Um, and I mean, he's known as a falsetto, but he actually has quite a deep uh, baritone to it. Yeah, that's uh, a great example. Um, you know, that's I've, I've told my wife that's a song I want to play. <laughs> oh dear! You always um, got to plan ahead, John. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, well, actually, mine will be, and I'm sorry, it isn't a spark song. Mine would be Wire, and Nice from here because it's basically about being up there and looking back. Yeah. So I'm, I don't know if I'm heading up there. So number one in heaven. What did you think? Oh, uh, let's see. Number one in heaven. Um, it was a great change. I love the songs that are on there. Um, it's a pity there was only six. I would rather they done a few more, but. Um, the album was, was was really good. The songs on there were terrific. The singles were great as well. Um, Virgin really pushed the, the boat out. Um, I very much enjoyed the 12-inch single. I can't remember which one it was, but I think it was... Um, yeah, No, the, the last one. Um, God, tryouts. tryouts so, and I think that's the one that has, the on the 12-inch, it has uh, Peter Cook, the comedian doing a, a jokey, you know, uh, talk, uh, sort of advert for the, for the band. And you could tell he, he was probably drunk when he did it. You know, it's right. just funny. Which he took to cook, you know, he, is a, he did Derek and Clive, which is an extremely rude album with Dudley Moore. Um, yeah. <laughs> Number one in heaven, I remember hearing it and I just thought, okay, well, I'm used to them doing something new all the time. And it just seemed like another evolution in Sparks. Yeah, I, I, well, the one the, the one memory I do have of that as well is that um, a mate and I used to go to uh, discos, clubs and stuff around that time, 79. And I remember going to a, a club where very early on, about half seven, eight o'clock, way too early. And the guy put um, number one song in heaven on, the 12-inch version. And people were looking around not knowing what to do because it was taking some time before it got to the bit where you're like, boom, 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 right. boom, and away you go, you know. So we were like looking to dance, but then uh, just wait, you know, two and a half minutes later. What an interesting choice. Usually I did get I did hear beat the clock a couple of times. Once I heard it in New York, uh, and it, we someone took us to a disco and they played it. And at that night, Tammy Wynette came in the door, hang out, hung out there for about 10 minutes and then was out the door. But Whoa. they did play Beat the Clock. Name, name dropping there, look there, Monty. Tell oh, me yeah, yeah. That's my I, I that's my claim to fame. Well, 
Absolutely. Nate, yeah, Tammy Wynette. Yeah, she and I are, are like that. Um, <laughs> <Holy guy. laughs> yeah, but now you also mentioned that uh, Little Beethoven isn't one of your favorites. No, um, Tin Hat on, um, getting prepared to, for the for the for the uh, flack. Um, no, it's not. Um, the recent Mojo magazine that had the top ten choices by fans who um, submitted their own top ten for them quite that recently. Was that was a weird had, list. had gratuitous sacks as number one, and thank heaven for that. But um, and Little Bay album, I think, it was number four. Um, and there are three albums in that top ten of Sparks, which I can only say they're my least favorite. There's no, there's never a worst. You, yeah. you never have a, a worst Sparks album. Um, yeah. That just can't be because there's always something on an album that that you like, even if it's not all of it. Um, but yeah, there's three albums out of that top ten that I would not have had in the top ten for sure. That was a weird list, yeah. But that yeah. I mean, the fact that they yeah. included Introducing, which is another um, album, which you know, very underrated. Um, a big I, beat. I, is I, one I, of my tried, I tried with Introducing. I've tr- I tried really? so hard. I, the only thing I conclude is it was meant as a joke. <laughs> I, I absolutely love um, Over the Summer. That should have been released as a single here. It never was. No. Um, well, there's a lot to say about their history, though, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was nice to come back to doing proper songs again because, I mean, Big Beat for me was um, a disappointment after In, in the Spring. Um, I thought the, the album was... Uh, it's meant to be some sort of proto punk thing now. It was just not... It was New York. It was, so to say, it was very American. And for us Brits, for me anyway, I found it a little bit grating. I, I, and I lyrically, it was also pretty poor. I mean, you know, nothing to do. Um, yeah, I want to be like someone else or whatever. Nah, big boy and fill her up. Nah. <laughs> well, by that time, correct me if I'm wrong, but my impression is by that time in the UK, uh, things had just moved on. I mean, sparks were were an afterthought after Indiscreet, and then they moved to America. You know, so at, here they were riding at the top of the charts, then came Indiscreet, which mixed reception. Tell me if I'm wrong. And then they moved out of the country altogether. And it seemed like they their the interest in the UK waned somewhat at that point. Yeah, I mean, Big Beat sounded like it was a, a contract filler. You know, the last album, Get It Out. I know it wasn't, and I know the males really wanted to do something that was truly American and strip it down, and they, they did kind of sack the band over here. Um, but uh, for me, introducing came at around the right time. It, it, it got them back into making really good, solid songs again. Um, and lyrically, it's, it's really quite good. I mean, you know, you, you couldn't get anything as funny as something like Ladies where you have um, yeah. Yeah. a Joan of Arc sits and smokes. That's just so wrong in all levels. It <laughs> like, is. You know, it is. Yes. I agree with yeah, you on that song. Yeah. <laughs> but it's brilliant. It's, you know, superb humour. Yeah. Um, and that goes against the grain. in the, and, and that's what sparks do. In the, at that time in Britain, uh, punk was, was a big thing. Punk New Wave was, was on, on the crest. And so introducing being very Beach Boys is doesn't really fit. And of course, the hit no hit single here. Did you um, uh, try to play it for people? And they were like, "What? The oh hell? yeah, what the oh hell? yeah." I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, my mates were all thought it was quite good and bought the album. But um, I think from there, once you got to Georgia and Marauders' time and, the, and those two two albums, um, that rekindled people's love. Um, with Sparks and funnily enough it gave them this synth pop uh, it wasn't really synth pop but you know and, and, and they've been included in that over here you know you get the Spandau Ballets and the Duran Durans and you've got Sparks and you think wow how did that happen but they're, they're included in that well um, I, would, I would say it's not disco but this is another discussion but I, I yeah. don't believe that I don't hear it as a disco album I hear it as a lot of disco elements, but I hear it again. I I hear everything as a Sparks album. Yeah, I think it's probably because Giorgio Moroder was was uh, very much a, a supposedly a disco man because yeah. of Donna Summer and his own you know his own music. 
um, which is pretty you know, pretty good. You know, the quality of that is is really 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 good. What he was doing. Um, so I I have no problem with the fact that he works. It, okay, he did he did write um, co-write quite a few of the songs from Number One. Um, didn't get much of a say on on the next on Terminal Jive, but but fully okay. They're well, great records, those two. Hmm. Well, the first one I agree with you completely. <laughs> you don't you like Terminal like Jive. It has. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, you know, uh, Christian and I talked about this on the um, podcast, and and I, yeah, it, it's okay. It's okay, but it's it just doesn't really, in my mind, come together. It doesn't really sound like a Sparks album in my mind. But you hear it differently, and that's that's the great thing about this show is that everybody has different perspectives. Everybody has different favorite albums and least favorite albums, as you said. Yeah. And it's just fascinating to hear where people are coming from. Yeah, I, I mean that and it's a, for me that's another underrated album. And you know, you've got songs on there like Noisy Boys and Stereo. They're brilliant. They could have been singles, but didn't happen. Well, um you know what I think is an underrated album? Music that you can dance to. Yeah, I I I'd, I'd agree with that slightly, but uh-huh. it's not <laughs> one of my favorites. I mean I, the the live version is really good of um of music, and I think that that is great, but that album Nah, it wasn't wasn't for me, I, and I'm really glad they didn't include change on it. In the UK, you don't get change on that; you get armies of the night. Yeah, and I'm glad about that. Really? Um, yeah, yeah, because I really liked change. I thought that was brilliant. It's like it's like another one later on when why they. Were you, why were you happy that it wasn't on the album? Because I wanted it to be a, a unique on its own, a, you know, a oh, Tommy okay. single that was really good. Yeah, um, I, song I think that's, it's that's, one of their top ten songs. Yeah, yeah. and it, it's it, the same goes for um, National Crime Awareness Week. Um, brilliant. I mean, you you've got to thank Finney Tribe, the Scottish um, house acid house band, who put that out and you know mixed it, produced it, put it out on their own label that got Spark noticed again. Yeah, I mean, that that is was, superb. That you great. wouldn't have got gratuitous sax, I don't think, if you hadn't have had. National Crime Awareness Week. That's a great point. That's a great point. Uh, it, this has been so much fun talking to you. Uh, any final thoughts you want to make sure people know about John Ashdown and his relationship to Sparks and <laughs> what they better get and listen to right now? Oh, dear, oh, dear. Um, no, I don't think so. I, um, people will always love the Sparks that, that they buy, that they listen at certain times. And as I say it's always down to the time of the year or whenever it is or what's going on in their private life. But often either sparks lift them out of, um, say, bad times or, or times where things aren't working for them, or it's a celebration of how great their life is. And there it is. There's a sparks album, you know, whether it's latte or whether it's introducing or whether it's number one or, or you know let's give credence to the first two albums which are which are brilliant i love um the very first album and um, my favorite off of that was um fletcher on Arama. i think that's absolutely brilliant brilliant i think when they played uh beaver O'Lindy. oh yeah I, uh, beaver is good um it's not my favorite on that i think underground it is... worked on it it worked live so well yes it's such yeah. a wonderful treat. Yeah, I remember the when they when they came back in '95 here, '94, '95. They were doing um, Do Re Mi um, as well. So you know, you, you threw in some of the older stuff, uh, and it and it sounded just as good. Well, John, you have been so generous with your time. So yeah, sorry me... about the dark background. Eh. You know, <laughs> I'm sorry about the fact that it's very obvious I'm sitting in a bedroom, right? So <laughs> yeah. I think we can, it's okay. Uh, but this was great. And I want to thank you. And, uh, you know, I, I want to thank everybody for paying attention to all this great conversation that we had and for being part of the new Sparks Entertainment and Art community that we are building. Please subscribe. Please use the email if you want to get in touch. And, uh, I think that's going to wrap it up. So this is Monty signing off. Thank you. Thank you.